I was holding on to all of the energies from so many different people, right? So this thing was coming out and, and this thing, and I saw that it was actually like stuck. It was hanging on to like the inside of my guts and I'm just pulling, pulling and it finally comes out and it was painful. It might seem like a movie to everyone listening, but I, like when I was pulling this thing out, I felt it. I felt something in my hand. It lands all on the ground and I could just see all these memories. And you know, I see like people and faces and I see myself kind of going through the motions of all of the work that I had did all of those years. And it was kind of like this entity that I had extracted from myself. And so that was a big part of the process. And I think that that combined with all of the, the therapy and the repressed memories that came up and forgiving people. And Vanessa, it is so good to have you on the Soul Seeker podcast. You have been here before, but it was different. You were here with our good friend, Alex Ruiz. And that was almost two years ago, a year and a little over a year and a half ago, where we encountered a massive UFO experience and really where it seems like your story of doing this energy work really started. So with that, welcome back to the podcast. And this time is all about you. So happy to have you here. Thank you, Sam. I know I'm so excited. And last time it was like last minute, right? <laughs> I think you texted me like on the day of and I was like, okay, I'm ready. But no, it's totally good to be back. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's good to have you here. And we get to do a deep dive of your story. And we were just uh, chatting, catching up a little bit before we hit record, just about your journey and your evolution of really going from, we'll just get straight into it, stripper to sex worker to realtor to now healer. Now, can you tell us a little bit about that? I know that is enough for like five episodes or a whole podcast in <laughs> itself. So it's a really big question. But for people that aren't too familiar with your story, or even people that know you, but might not know this background, could you give them some context around this? Yeah. So I mean, I contribute my whole journey of, of healing, of transformation, everything that I'm doing today and, and helping people on their personal healing journeys, I have my personal experience to thank. And I don't know I would be in this state of, you know, reclaiming power and healing trauma and reintegrating with the shadow and doing all of this deep, heavy work if it wasn't for me going through I'll just say it, dark times, times of confusion and not, you know, giving away my power so often. It was like a normal thing for me. That was also a trauma response that I was living out for many, many years. And, but coming out of that is like the biggest reward and it gives my life so much meaning. And so I'm happy to share my story. And I think it's really important for many people to understand how someone can go through different phases and then come into a different state of serving others in other ways. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. And let's, let's go a little bit deeper here. So you went to college, you grew up in LA and you went to college to, is it Pepperdine, right? Yeah. Well, I did undergrad in Atlanta and I did a political science degree for my bachelor's. And then I got, went to Pepperdine in Malibu, California for my master's degree in public policy and government. Wow. Public policy and government. Now, I don't know much about like the education system, colleges and whatnot. Like I went to a state school and, you know, kind of bare minimum, but Pepperdine is like a legit university and it's expensive, right? Yeah, it's expensive. It's hard to get in. <laughs> right. So the whole enchilada, it, it's like, but you know, and it was like a double life for me. And I'm sure we'll get into this in the podcast, but you know, I was, I was doing all of the, the, stripping and the sex work during that time That's what and it was at. like yeah it was like this double life and it almost helped me kind of cover things up for the moment um and then I think in a sense I wasn't too hard on myself like kind of I was able to disassociate because I had I was like fragmented into two different personalities so it was pretty interesting so when you got into Pepperdine, were you already stripping or was that like part of the plant? Okay, you already were at that time. Yeah, so I started at 19. Okay. I started at 19. So I think that was like one year after high school. I was already in college working on my bachelor's degree in political science. And you know, when I started, it was definitely out of necessity. And and I gotta say, because I was in this industry for, you know, stripping and sex work combined was a total of 10 years from 19 to 29. 
So not only do I have my story to reference, but so many people, so many other young ladies and young women like myself, um, you know, some people do start to do it out of necessity for, you know, just to kind of get on their feet, to put themselves through school. That's kind of what I started with the first couple of Mm -hmm. years. And then I think I got (laughs) sucked into this whole other lifestyle where my shadow personality was like in full control and it felt like I couldn't stop. Um, And it just kind of went in so many different directions. Absolutely. That makes sense. So I have a tough question for you and topic because I was talking with a friend, uh, a female woman uh, a few months ago, and somehow this topic came up of uh, both stripping and sex work. And it was more than a trigger for her. Like she got really worked up and upset about it. And she's one of those people that's kind of um, trying in her thirties around give or take. Right. But still trying to figure out like the whole money thing and paycheck to paycheck and almost um, has this like resentment against women that use their bodies like through sex for money. And I don't see it that way at all. I totally understand. Like, I I shouldn't say totally understand, but a certain um, point, I understand both sides, right? So I'm curious if you had to deal with that, if you've had those conversations when you're doing, I mean, double life, so probably not many people knew, uh, but really now that you're starting to speak out about it, if you're starting to notice that people's perceptions of you are starting to change because of anything like that. Yeah, you know, Yes, yes, yes. And I think I almost, I had to catch myself because I was hesitant about, you know, really sharing my story. Although, you know, I know exactly, I I know that my story needs to be shared because it's not just my story. There's so many women, again, till this day, that if they just hear the transformation, I believe it will be inspiring for them. So that's really what's driving me to share. But there was a moment where I was like, oh my God, I'm going to trigger people. (laughs) They're going to call me names. You know, my family might disown me, Mm. which I don't think that's going to be the case. Um, And if so, it's like, I'll be fine. You know, like I've done so much work and you've witnessed me for a couple of years, like, and we're in the same, you know, community. It's like, I went deep for six years. My, My healing process since then was, has been about almost six years and it's continuing. So Yeah, it's definitely a triggering concept and topic for, I think, everyone involved, right? Mm -hmm. The person who was doing the work, the guy who hired the work, and for everyone else who's not directly involved, but they have some kind of feeling. It's just, you know, there's a lot of shame involved on many different sides, and I'm not shameful. It took me years. I mean, it took, I even had some relationships that were testing me in so many different ways because I thought I could open up to the person I was, the partner I was romantically involved in. And sure enough, they ended up shaming me, you know, for so long for that. And so I got, and I believe that was a lesson. I believe that was meant to happen because here I am, you know, I don't, and I don't feel the shame or the blame or the guilt or any of those lower vibrations around this to me again, like I said before, this is my mess is my message. I've turned my pain into my power. And I think that this is a topic that really needs to get pulled out underneath the rug. And we really need to talk about it because I have a lot of friends myself who are kind of, they're halfway coming out of the ex stripper closet. You know, they have successful businesses and they're like, oh yeah, I was an ex stripper, but they stopped there. And I personally know that there's so much more to that story and we're not giving the world the real medicine that's there when we're not telling the full story. And I believe that triggers are a portal. And triggers are, you know, it's an opportunity for transformation. So just like the young lady that you were talking about, um, yeah, it's it's triggering for a, for everyone involved. But I think that this is part of the awakening, bringing these mm. kinds of topics to the forefront. Absolutely, and it, these uncomfortable conversations, to your point, is where the growth is. And I we'll get into your ayahuasca story, I'm sure. At least the calling for it, because it's so fascinating. I would love to go back to at some point in terms of uh, your dream of like incarnating and going through the portal. And we will talk about that later, just seeds. So there's a few things here, right? Because 
we kind of are fast forwarding and glossing over uh, how you got into stripping and how that led to sex work. And, you know, I'm sure that story is kind of similar for most women, more or less. Sure. Uh, right. Yeah. I would, I'm generalizing, but you know, we can use our imagination to see how the, yeah. how it evolves from there. What I'm more curious about is how you get out of that. How do you get out of the world of sex work and stripping because the money is so good and because you're in the lifestyle. And then the second part of that, because it seems like where your focus is at is more women that have already gotten out of it and more like speaking about it. And on the latter side of that, what I'm curious about is, do you think it's important for I mean, it really depends, I guess, for all women, their unique cir circumstances, but I guess in your situation and to truly like own your power and be sovereign and show up the way, uh, you know, unapologetically, like to the T, like you're the embodiment <laughs> of that. Like anyone go to her Instagram, it's linked in the show notes and you can see Vanessa like keeps it real and has no shame. <laughs> but for you, I would imagine it's got to be so freeing because you're now being open about it and you don't have those like quote unquote skeletons in the closet. Yeah, it, it is freeing and it's a part of the process. And, and you're right. The toughest part was coming out of the industry and, and stopping the stripping and stopping the sex work. And there was a time where I was like, okay, I'm not going to strip anymore. But then I just ended up doing more sex work and then vice versa. And it was like, I couldn't, and this is way after I had graduated from my master's degree, you know, and I had tried to get a regular job. Well, I had many job offers because I had, you know, the education to get the jobs. And I was working at polit in politics at one point for a congressperson. And I, it was just like this crazy life. Like when I talk about fragmentation and, I, and that's at the core, I mean, we all have it to different levels but it's like I was fragmented and compartmentalized into so many p different pieces I I wonder how I operated as one person <laughs> but yeah coming out of it was a struggle and then um but the the ayahuasca and, and I don't know if now's the right time to it's get perfect. into it okay cool so so ayahuasca plant medicine I just you know I I knew that my time was ending with it and and it was hard to quit because the money was there I had started to do a little bit of real estate you know I I was mm. conscious enough to know like okay I'm going to go get my real estate license I think I had might have only sold like one or two houses at that point I was like barely get my gears going and for my 30th birthday I just I think one Google search led to the next I ended up on this website and there wasn't a lot of information and because they were only open for about a year and it, there was, ayahuasca was nowhere on their website and it said plant medicine. I still didn't know what that was. I didn't Google it. I just thought that, oh, this is going to be a nice 30th birthday. I'm going to go do yoga and, and you're you know, vegan. Some, yeah. And I'm, yeah, they have vegan gluten-free food and there's spa and cleanses and colon cleanses and massages, you know. I just I, thought it was going to be like this little vacation. Yeah, I meant the fact that you're vegan, like plant medicine. Most of y'all listening, I imagine at this point, you're familiar with ayahuasca and uh, psychedelic and it's one of the most powerful psychedelics used intentionally in ceremony. And they say it's like over 12 years of therapy, You've done many podcasts about ayahuasca. That's how this podcast was born. So just going to some most of you know, but otherwise you can check out other resources. But yeah, when Vanessa says um, she saw a plant medicine, I think I remember you saying this, like you were thinking more because you were vegan, like plant, like you I wasn't thinking. vegan at that time, but I just thought like, okay, yeah, I, I need to detox with some like plants, like juices or something. Not, That's not psychedelic. Not psychedelic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you signed up for this retreat, which you had no idea what you're getting in for. Please continue. Yeah, didn't tell anyone where I was going, went out of the country. You know, I think I told one person so that they could open up the door for some of the houses for my clients. And that was it. And the, the, the night that I got there, I started to understand, you know, I went to the place and they, you know, they took me to the little on-site doctor to kind of check me out, make sure I was hydrated enough to participate in the ceremony. And I'm like going, what, what ceremony? And I'm thinking, like, this, is this a herbal thing? Like, are we just going to be taking some vitamins, like singing Kumbaya or something? <laughs> I was so naive in the best way possible. I don't, I don't mean anything by that. But 
it was the the point here is like my intuition just guided me. It and it, it even put me into autopilot to to the point to where I wouldn't do too much research or ask so many questions because in this case it actually served me to just kind of show up blindsided in a way. And by the time I ended up there, I'm like, well, you know, I paid five thousand dollars. I took the time off from work. I'm all the way over here in another country. I might as well just go all in. And then there was some uh, celebrity shaman on that particular night. And it was the eve of my 30th birthday. So I was like, well, normally I'm going big partying in the worst way possible, right? In Hollywood, in the clubs with, you know, drinks and drugs and all that stuff. And I was like, well, I mean, and, and I'm, I'm a risk taker. So it wasn't unusual. It was just taking a risk in a different way. And next thing you know, I had a really intense night, a lot of purging energetically, physically, um, I went through 30 years of therapy, literally 30, because it was on my 30th birthday. Mm. You know, not just that night, but I was there for the whole week and I did it five nights in a row kind of thing. So yeah, wow. it was really powerful. That's incredible. So from there, I, I forget what you said earlier, but were you already, you were kind of trying oh, to get out of the industry. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So during the the five nights that I was doing ayahuasca, when I got back. I mean, there's so much that happened in those five nights. We could always do a part two, or we can come back to those later. But when I got back, to, you know, home in LA, at, when I was still living in LA at that time, I was just, my brain was completely rewired. I mean, I, and then during my journeys, I had traumas, childhood traumas come up that I had no idea about. I mean, they were repressed and suppressed so deeply in my psyche. I don't know if I ever would have got them out without the help of um, ayahuasca. And so it was just really, really powerful. And, and not that the traumas just came up, you know, and, and now they're just sitting there and I'm like, Oh, now what, now I have all these traumas to deal with. I was completely held throughout that whole week by the plant medicine. And, you know, I went through a process of forgiving the person and I was, um, I didn't know it at the time, but I was time traveling and multidimensional traveling and working with the quantum field. And it's so funny because now that's the work that I do now without including any kind of plant medicine. But I, I, you know, I help people through those kinds of journeys to where they kind of come out and they're like, oh my God, I feel like I was on, you know, a, a psychedelic kind of thing. Cause I can, you know, take them through that quantum field. But that was like my first experience and my traumas, I was able to heal and integrate experiences my, in my life through using the quantum field and multidimensional traveling and all of that good stuff. And so by the time I got back home, I was just wired completely different. I was also like finally in touch with my emotions because I had been numb. If you could imagine being in sex work for 10 years or stripping for 10 years and having this double life and playing, you know, all these different personalities and politics and uh, school and all these. And then, you know, there's a whole another personality that comes out when family's around it was a lot to juggle. And so I created so many different layers of masks that I just forgot that we're even there. I thought that they, that those masks were actually me, but they all fell away naturally coming out of the ayahuasca experience. And I was finally in touch with my emotions and I was no longer like this numb diva, party diva that I was. And I saw a whole nother side of me. And so I just got to know myself and I just knew I knew that that was the cutoff. There was, it, it felt like that was the cold turkey moment, although it wasn't cold turkey because I had so much therapy within one week. I just felt like I wasn't in the same place to go back. So, and I didn't need to, because luckily I had already, I had put in a couple of, I had planted a couple of seeds, you know, months before by selling one or two houses. So when I got back, I mm -hmm. just went deeper into the real estate and went from there. So had you not done ayahuasca because you were already trying to exit the industry, if you just had to like guess, how do you think that process would have looked uh, getting out of the industry without ayahuasca? You know, I think about that often and I just don't know. It could have went so many different ways. I mean, I really was struggling internally, but I didn't know it. And I think that's a little dangerous because... I kind of saw myself bringing a lot of my shadow aspects into real estate and maybe merging the sex work with the real estate. You have no idea what's possible. I don't know what people do. I don't, I don't know if there's someone out there doing that, but I just, I know like where I was at, I was still in this manipulative, dark, feminine energy, numb. Like I could totally see, I was just consumed by it. And, and also 
I don't know if I told you this before, but during ayahuasca, I did like the self exorcism in the bathroom okay. on one night. And it was a sex, it, it was a sex demon that came out of me. And this was real. I did not feel like this was a psychedelic experience. Oh, please share this I mean, story. <laughs> okay, cool. I like, I went to the bathroom, you know, and I could tell that something was trying to come out of me. And I had already kind of, this is going to get a little sensitive. And if you're eating, you might want to pause, but you know, people purge during ayahuasca and you know, you don't have to necessarily go into the bathroom to do exactly that. You have everything that you need to do that where in your little spot. But for some reason, I just went to the bathroom because I knew that there was, it was going to be an intense moment. And I just, before I could even make it all the way to the toilet, I just fell on all fours and my back like arched all the way up like a cat. I mean, it felt like my, my stomach was trying to reach the ceiling. And then my mouth opened. And because I was on the medicine, my mouth felt like it was opening 10 times bigger than what it is. And then there was like this black thing, like kind of, it had a head that was like stuck. This is really graphic. And it had a head that was stuck in my mouth. And I grabbed one, I, you know, I had one hand holding me on all fours or threes or whatever and I took the other hand I started to pull it out Whoa. pulling this thing out and then it had it was almost like this black tar snake thingamajig and it had faces and energies because I was I was holding on to all of the energies from so many different people right um sex is a is an energetic exchange and and then not just that the other people that I that I had in my life as well and so this thing was coming out and again my my back it was like my whole body was just kind of like curving and 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 like com not convulsing but just like contorting there's the word contorting and this thing and I saw that it was actually like stuck it was hanging on to like the inside of my guts my womb space my sacral my yoni, my stomach, everything. It was like grabbing on, grabbing on. And there was a conversation happening that I don't remember to this day. I, cause I was so um, involved in trying to get this thing out and I'm just pulling, pulling and it finally comes out and it was painful. Again, this, this seems like a 3d experience. Like this might seem like a movie to everyone listening, but I, like when I was pulling this thing out, I felt it. I felt something in my hands. I wasn't pulling at air. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. this was my first exorcism. Anyway, so it, it lands all on the ground and I could just see all these memories. And, you know, I see like people and faces and I see myself kind of going through the motions of all of the work that I had did all of those years. And it was kind of like this entity that I had extracted from myself. And so that was a big part of the process. And I think that that combined with all of the, the therapy and the repressed memories that came up and forgiving people and, you know, seeing my past lives and future lives and talking to different parts of myself, all of that combined that happened within those five days definitely played a role in me being a different person by the time I got back. Yeah, that's, that's gnarly. That's absolutely <laughs> incredible. I love stories like that. It's thank you for sharing that. And yeah. Just taking a moment to kind yeah, of yeah, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> it's sitting that ayahuasca, it, psychedelics, plant medicine, uh, what happens there? And I mean, there's someone I talked with just yesterday, actually, who's in his uh, I'd say probably fifties and never done a psychedelics in his life, and he was telling me ghost stories that he's had in different interactions, like quote unquote ghost stories, right? And then I shared some that weren't really my stories, but from friends. Because for whatever reason, I'm always for a while, I was always calling this stuff in. As you know, we had the massive UFO experience and I got really excited with that. And still to this day, that was like the biggest thing, even with all the different plant mess and ceremonies. Anyways, though, I shared a couple stories and this guy who had only experienced, you know, actually experienced quite a few quote unquote ghost stories and things like that. Two of them he had experienced almost the exact same thing. And I could tell he had spirits chills. So, I mean, you never know, like, and this is something that I'd like to get into as we kind of are in a rabbit hole right now and kind of off kilter, but it's good in terms of like the different Claire senses and gifts and like the gifts that you have and whatnot, what's your take in terms of as humans, as souls, like, is it that some of us are more open 
is, do we all have these gifts and then some have them more than the others or some people just more of a clear channel? Like what's your take on that? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think it's a combination of choice and then also like our destiny. So I believe, you know, some of us have, you know, a certain life here. Like I picked the life that I have. I, you know, I picked everything, my traumas, like everything that we're talking about that I've been through. It's like, I selected this as my assignments here on earth school, because I figured that it would help me with healing and, and being able to dark, dance with dark energies and help people with exorcisms. And um, sometimes I channel those dark energies and it's not my favorite thing to do, but it just happens. And sometimes it's necessary in the process. But I think that, yeah, like our life experiences can open us up. And then also our initiation can open us up into what abilities we're willing to integrate into our lives. And so ayahuasca being my initiation into my healing journey, it's like I experienced so many things. Like, again, I was initiated through ayahuasca and on day one, here I am doing a self-exorcism on myself. So that was like, right. okay, well, I got that ability. What else can I do? You know, then I was like hearing voices and, you know, talking to, to my spirit guides. And I was like, okay, clear audience. And so I was just kind of going down the list and just being open to all of those things. And it was through that initiation process. So I think I would say to anyone exploring some of that, see if you can see if you've had an initiation process into your healing journey. Some people mm -hmm. don't. It's, it could be gradual. Nothing's wrong with that. Not everyone has to have a shocking experience like I did. But see what's starting to come through because that's normally a sign of what of your higher self saying, Hey, here's not that it's a shortcut, but you know, here's a, a, a here's what you do in your future timelines. You know, you've already done this because everything has already happened. So right. I'm just going to put this in front of you one more time and let's see if you take the opportunity to run with it. If not, no, you know, it might show up again and again later on. So when you say that uh, you've already done this because everything that has already happened, uh, please elaborate. <laughs> Okay. You know, I, I understand it on a very soul level and it's so hard to, to articulate, but I'm just going to take a stab at it anyway. It's like for myself, I feel like I, like even this podcast, like this morning I woke up, like, just like, it, like I'm looking around and everything is in place. Like as exactly how I saw it this morning, like even my water bottle is sitting on my counter in the same exact spot when I just had a visualization. So it was just like, we're just, I'm just remembering what took place. And now my focus, the reason why this seems like the only reality right now is because I'm choosing for this to be my main focus and my main experience to really soak in the, the fullness of it, the essence of it, the lessons, the, the joys, the thrills, the fears, the stresses, the, the journey of, you know, building my business and telling the world about my medicine, telling the world about my my story. I mean, what fun would it be if I, if I didn't have like this, this narrowed down perspective and I'm, you know, like this grand soul and I'm like, oh yeah, I did that already. But I, don't, I have no memory of like what it was actually like to go through the steps. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like uh Bufo, right? Cause you've done five MEO DMT. I, I'm, I believe yes. I'm pretty sure you have. <laughs> yeah. Like terrible yeah. Wing, huh? <laughs> but, yeah. Oh, you supported me through that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyways, um, yeah. So Bufo 5 MEO DMT. I know a lot of you guys are familiar with these medicines and have heard me talk about it before, but this one is arguably the most powerful psychedelic known to man. It, it, I mean, right there, ayahuasca, iboga, ibogaine all that type of stuff. But uh, Bufo, how I experienced 5-MeO DMT Bufo is that time doesn't exist, right? And that's really when it started to make sense to me. I call it the infinity medicine. And it all started to make sense to a certain point that can make sense because you, the brain can't really conceptualize it. But to me, it's like our higher self, our soul, is plugged into the ego. The con our consciousness is plugged into the ego of me, Sam, Vanessa is Vanessa right now. And then all of our other quote unquote lives or quote unquote future and past lives are playing out simultaneously 
right now as well with those different names and whatnot. And that's on this planet, off this planet, and other dimensions as well. And then it gets even more confusing and trippy with timelines because then there's Vanessa and there's Sam and there's like the timeline where you're still a sex worker right now, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that's yeah. it. And it, the, I mean, you can go crazy. Just if people do <laughs> yeah. literally go crazy. Paul Levy sure. is an amazing person to check out. He wrote the book, Dispelling with Tico. And he, he's been on this podcast and he talks about how back in, I think it was the seventies or the eighties, they thought he was crazy. So they put him in, they put him in a mental institution. And the only thing that kept him from going crazy was he knew he wasn't crazy. Right. So it's the whole projecting onto others. But one of the places I want to take this or actually bring up for a moment here is I think about the movie Fight Club and there's that scene where they're in the movie theater and they show how the film works and how like they have to take off the film and then they put on the next reel and there's kind of that black little spot there. And then the movie, you know, for those of you guys that have seen it, they put the cock there, they put the dick there. Right. Uh, but in real life, I think we've all experienced it where it kind of just happened right now, actually, where there's like a snap and it goes black. And it's almost like when you go to the movie theater, like if you pay attention, yeah, we all know it's kind of grainy and whatnot and the different things, but you can see that black for just for a split second when they switch the film reel. And that's to me when we switch timelines. And I don't know if that's something you've thought about before, but I've noticed that a few times where I've been deep discussions even talking about timelines and it's happened like yeah <laughs> it's wild and then i start to notice different things and then elizabeth april a lot of people are familiar with her she's a youtuber i remember when i was first going down this path it was around the time you and i met it was probably right after right before uh the ufo experience that we had in 2020 and she was talking about 5d symptoms and like uh, changing to the 5d the fifth dimension timeline and it was like things uh, reappearing and dis or disappearing and reappearing and breaking. And I was having so many things that just did not make sense. And then it culminated with my front tooth breaking when I bit into a bite of pasta. Like it was just, the whole thing was just nuts. But anyways, I wanted to bring that into the conversation and see if there's anything that on this topic that you'd like to kind of pull at and discuss a little bit more. Yeah, well, I, I want to say that, you know, I call them parallel lives. I don't really mm. refer to them as uh, past or future as much I like as I more. used to. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> it's been a part of my own healing journey because guess what I've been doing? You know, part of my, during my five and six years, just doing recovery in addition to all the other stuff, right? The community, the workshops, the breath work, the meditations, the ayahuasca, the, the, um, so it's, you know, every, everything that's been a part of my journey. And it's, I just want to be clear to, to, to people, you know, there wasn't just one path. It was very multifaceted. Um, but in my own private time, working with my parallel lives was my biggest assistance. And, um, and my spirit guides just showed me what to do. Like I, you know, they would just kind of take me through this journey. And I just, I didn't really know like the process. Like now, again, I, I help other people do that kind of process and talk to their younger self or, you know, a self from a different life, but it's just, it's so fascinating. And like, I, I remember, for instance, let me see, see if I could think of like a really quick example. Yeah. I remember I was dealing with a lot of overwhelm actually that surfaced for some reason, you know, Bufo is amazing because it brings up so much, it, it, especially things that need to be resolved. And I couldn't figure out why I was, I was dealing with so much overwhelm. And that was actually attached to a past um, parallel life of mine. Mm. And I went into this journey where I was able to like have a full conversation with him. And it felt like we were in the same timeline. And I think that's like, I, like in that moment, it was really true that there is no time. Or I like to say that's also very complicated. I like to say that time and space is very fluid. And so it was very fluid in that moment that I got to speak to, it was, it was a guy in my past, in that particular past life that was um, in World War II. And I had, I got to have a conversation, oh, excuse me, <laughs> frog in my throat. I got to have a conversation with him. And so that was just a really real experience. And it helped me resolve a real emotion that I was having trouble with in this life. 
Um, and they're tied together. And I felt like as soon as I resolved it in that conversation and resolved it in this life, it probably impacted, mm -hmm. you know, that life that happened in 1942, you know, technically. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and Reese, okay, so we're going to climb out of this rabbit hole first because yeah. that, that was that was <laughs> we fun. We're going, yeah, we're <laughs> going to climb back out. And you went and did ayahuasca. You sat yeah. with ayahuasca for five times. And you went so deep on that. You pretty much had your roadmap and your marching orders and just the ultimate truth that you experienced that not that it was easy and I'm totally projecting on you. So feel free to change it, but you were able to get out of the industry and build a new path for yourself, right? More or less correct. Yeah. I, it just, it, it rewired me. That's, that's mm. all I can say. And, and, and also, well, here, let me actually this, I just got a message to help me clarify this. The, the work I was doing was a trauma response. For 10 years, I was expressing a trauma response. When I became aware of the traumas, it also highlighted that the stripping and the sex work was just me living out the fawn, right? There's four different types of um, trauma responses, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. The fawn is you know, giving away your power, people pleasing, just kind of doing things to avoid conflict, doing things, you know, just because it seems easier, not really standing up for yourself. And I, you know, I can't say it other than just really giving away your power. And, and, and that became so normal for me. But when I, you know, when I went through the ayahuasca and I did the healing and I got to, you know, see my, my younger self and then have a conversation in another dimension with the person that was a part of that childhood trauma for me and I, I got to have that conversation and accept it and forgive them it's like I wasn't stuck in the trauma responses mm. the same way I was so I think that's what I mean when I keep saying I was rewired I that trauma response was it melted away in a big way by the time I got back and then it continued to unravel um, years after yeah, it's amazing because when you see people do ayahuasca for the first time and they have like my story is very similar to yours outside of like the specifics and scope but in terms of the trans transformation. And when you see people like us who didn't know what a ceremony was that weren't introduced to plant medicine. I mean, I don't know about you, but I did a lot of mushrooms before, but it was always recreational. I never knew about using them intentionally. So when I sat with ayahuasca the first time, very similar to you. It was like, there was no other option. It was like, I am going to act on what I was shown in terms of quote unquote, how I experienced a roadmap of what I needed to do. And I'm a completely different person. And I start to become a completely different person right away. So I understand exactly how that worked for you. And what's interesting is when we start to go back to the medicines and Maybe you experienced this, maybe you haven't, but it's almost become, it's been over three years now that I sat with ayahuasca the first time where I go back for, to the medicine and I'm seeking like a transformation. And then finally, like it started to be so clear to me. It's like, well, you think that you've been integrating and that you've integrated this and you understand and you talk about how 90% of the experience is integration but you're not quite ready for another transformation yet. So, right. Cause I've, I'm like, why is this not working? Why is this not working? So it's a, it's a hard thing to really sit with, but does that resonate with you? Yeah, it, it, it does. Um, but I actually didn't really integrate well <laughs> when I got back, I just, they mentioned it at the retreat, but there wasn't a lot of emphasis. I mean, I think there was like a couple workshops on like on why it's important, but they didn't really give us steps on what to do to integrate. So I was like, what is this integration thing? Oh, well, you know, I mean, I knew I was different. I, I probably journaled a few times and I had read over my journal entries from the ayahuasca thing, but I was still giving away my power. I, I was still in the trauma response, just not as deep. Part of it was because I was not really integrating and but it was to, again, to me, all of this was meant to be. Um, so I ended up in some romantic relationships that were complicated and challenging. And it kind of seemed like I was stuck in a whole nother dynamic where I didn't have my sovereignty. So I, I kind of equate that to like, okay, well, 
I know that it was meant to happen and I learned a lot more lessons. And again, I'm standing here like on this call with you because I've had all of these experiences. And, and that was the first time I did ayahuasca within that week. And I haven't done it since. But when I do do other medicines, I do place a lot more emphasis on the integration because I remember that one time in 2016 doing ayahuasca for the first time and not really knowing how to integrate. I was still in the, in the thick of the mud kind of thing. I mean, it helped again, like this was, this was the initiation for my healing process, but I was, I was still kind of grasping for something and I didn't know exactly how to get there. Yeah. And to your point earlier of saying like your mess is your message, like that's exactly what happened with me. I thought I was writing a book, uh, Soul Life Balance, uh, that was for workaholics hearing a whisper that there's something more and it was going to be pretty entry level and not go too deep about spirituality. And then through the writing process, the subtitle of my book, Soul Life Balance, became Igniting and Integrating Spiritual Awakenings. It was a book all about integration. And that was kind of my mess. I realized that I was chasing ceremony to ceremony. And yes, I would have like big things unfold and great experiences, but I was seeking that like massive transformation. So yeah, if anyone's interested in learning more, you can check out soullifebalancebook.com. It's uh, the links in the show notes. So Vanessa, over the years from 2016 to about 2020, would you say 2020, like the experience you and I had, with the UFOs, is that really when the energy work started to come through to that next level and propelled you to the work you do now? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, that Halloween night that, <laughs> that you were not and I were at, that was like, I had no previous, besides myself, you know, besides doing the exorcism on myself and the things that we already discussed, I didn't even, it didn't even cross my mind to like do any kind of energy work on other people or anything like that. Um, But it just came through so naturally. And it was almost like a remembrance. And luckily, you know, the container that we were in, oh, it was like a remembrance. Remembrance. It was a a remembrance. And so, yeah, I think that was the first one. And that was a couple of weeks after we had a big retreat with our, you know, our fit for service community. And there was a lot that happened in that week alone that I also contribute to my growth. That was like a whole nother ayahuasca journey without the ayahuasca. Yeah. <laughs> and that was my first time doing that retreat with that community. And so that was like another initiation to the next level. And then here I was two weeks later with you yeah. <laughs> and then the healing stuff started to come through. And then I was so excited. I think you might've remembered. I like was calling you and like texting you and like leaving you messages like, Sam, that was so cool. How do you feel? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Um, it's funny. Uh, Fit for service in law always feels like it's almost like an integration summit, a, integration retreat, but an activation retreat. It's a too. portal. Yeah, I think it's a portal portal. (laughs) for sure. And so many people have stories where it brings on their gifts. And I just remember we're overlooking uh, the ocean in Malibu, beautiful. And we saw the, the grid kind of like, I also call it the, uh, the, the disco ball in the sky. You can kind of see that, but then it was, it wasn't quite the disco ball. It was a grid. And then we saw a UFO. We did podcast on it a couple of years ago. It's a uh, soul seeker episode number 75. And that has all the details for the sake of this episode. We won't go into the story there, but I remember you were rubbing your, your hand on my heart and like, mm-hmm. uh, it's starting to like activate and I could feel energy moving throughout my body. I didn't know what it was. And I had experienced um, telepathy a few times at that point. I was just starting to bring that on. And you and I were having full on conversations, what we (laughs) were talking about, who knows at this point, right? But it was so clear to both of us. And I almost tested it too. I remember this like a pendulum because we weren't speaking and, you know, whatever you would do would be like working with a pendulum to confirm. Right, like I would blink or something, right? I think you told me at one point. (laughs) Oh, really? I I don't remember that, but yeah, maybe. um, I think one time you were like, oh yeah, I you told me to blink twice and I blinked twice, or I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I'm remembering it correctly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was a couple of years ago, uh, but yeah, that's where it all started. And fast forward here, almost two years later, I mean, you are crushing with energy work. I just had a session with you a couple of weeks ago and I've worked with many channelers from our good friend, John Barry, who is an amazing oh, I love John Barry. energy yeah. worker. 
<laughs> I've done, I did a podcast with him recently. He's great. Check out his work if you're not familiar with him. Candice Rossa, she's my go to Akashic Records reader. She's amazing. Mary Margrave, June, who else? A number of people, just the few that come to the top of my head. And what I really appreciate about how you approached your work was oftentimes in working with channelers and energy workers, in my experience, they do things to clear the uh, clear their energy so they can work on you. But you really put an emphasis on getting in resonance with each other and really getting me prepared through some breath work. And there was something about like folding my my looking to the back of my eyelids or something. And you you gave me this prompt to like lift into my astral body. And I, guys, I've done I've like paid for like Lori Ladd stuff and different people there, like influencers, to learn how astral travel and like done their meditations and. It, no, I, I need ketamine to astral travel be real. But um, yeah, I actually felt it with you. And I was like, oh, and I was on no medicine to be mm -hmm. completely clear. Right. And right. you brought me to my inner child. And I mean, for as much work as I've done and how much like I'm trying, I'm trying to open up my heart. I don't cry often. And when I do cry, like it's like that one tear that comes down slowly. And I remember like, it wasn't like a bawling crying, but I had like, I was dripping like a constant slow tear on both eyes coming down. Cause I actually felt like I was visiting with my inner child. And at this point, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly. And I mean, for me, what was so impactful in working with you wasn't so much the messages because that's why I've anyone that knows me well knows that I've probably done like at least 20 energy working channeling type things like paid for things that are expensive over the years. Um, probably I'm just making up numbers. So I'm very, I invest myself in this because I believe in it and I do get so much out of when someone gives me a message. And I don't look at that as uh, I don't let it become a self-fulfilling prophecy, just as much as in a medicine space. If I see something, I don't let that become a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think that's very important. But what I love to appreciate about working with you so much was it wasn't so much you telling me this stuff. It was me experiencing it, which was something totally new. And yeah, it was amazing. So thank Beautiful. You. Yeah, you're welcome. It's it's an honor. It's it's kind of like for anyone who's like, well, what what was that? It's just the only way I could describe it is it's like quant. You know, we're using the quantum field, and we're blending it with energy work and obviously astral traveling, also with therapy. So yeah, hopefully that gives people a a, a better idea of kind of what it entails. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you, because I know you have it like listed out on your Instagram and your your blog. You guys got to sign up for Vanessa's newsletter. Newsletter, it's fire. <laughs> I mean, this is how it all started. I think you posted something on Instagram, and I mean, you know, I'm probably like most people on Instagram. I scroll, I like, maybe I live leave a comment or something, but I don't really take action or or whatever. It's like, oh, cool, whatever. It's uh, you know, in marketing, we used to talk about like seven or eleven touches. I'm not sure how many touches you need now. Uh, former marketer, not so much these days, but you did post something about like a newsletter. And I'm like, okay, I, I like the inbox. That's for, I'm old school. I'm a business guy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I signed up for your newsletter. And that for me was like reading your story. You wrote something about being a stripper and a sex worker, something along those lines to- Not uh, yet. That one actually hasn't come out yet. I, I was actually warming people up. I talked about my party life. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I'm yeah. like warming people up to the idea that there's more there. But that's the one that's coming out next week. <laughs> Look at you. Look at that. Uh, I love the archetype, uh, the uh, journey you're leading them on. And from a business point of view for a second, I'll look at anyone that wants to create some content, like reverse engineering, like uh, go to where you want them to end up and then work backwards as Vanessa just articulated so well. like. She didn't just go in there with the punch, you know, she's like getting them ready and 
I was going to say lumen them up, but I was like, can't say that, but, <laughs> but you know, you know what I'm saying? So anyways, sign up for your newsletter. And then I started getting those. And then that's when I reached out to you to do this. And yeah, it was absolutely incredible. So what are the different modalities that you use? Okay, loaded question, but I'll, I'll just keep okay. it super simple. Because <laughs> again, I, I, you know, whatever has come to me from my spirit guides that I, I work closely with. Um, and, and also, I've, I've had a lot of, you know, work from other healers and from other shamans. And that was a big part of my training process. I mean, I thought I was just getting, a, you know, going through my healing process and having someone help me and they were doing the channeling work or they were doing the shamanic work on me, but it, it also gave me extra tools along with all the, you know, the things I was taught during my plant medicine journeys. Um, so I do uh, quantum energy work, which that's a very vague term. Deepak Chopra coined that term, but that can mean so many different things. So just be mindful when you're comparing, you know, different people that do that kind of work. i I should probably really change the name to like multidimensional traveling or multidimensional therapy <laughs> or something. Along multidimensional those lines. therapy is good. It tells you what it is. So it's, basic, it's, a, it's yeah. a little bit more targeted. Yeah. So that, that they'll probably change right after this podcast, you know, so there's that. And then I do reconnective healing, which is one of my newest services. And you could Google what that, what, what it is. It was founded in 1993 from a chiropractor in LA and it's a very powerful modality. And they have some studies about how it compares to Reiki and Qigong as healing methods and the results that people receive when they receive this reconnected healing is more potent than the healing that they would receive with Qigong or Reiki. So I do the reconnected healing. That's one. And then, like we said, we're going to rename the other thing, the multidimensional therapy, traveling, whatever we said. Um, and then human design is a, is a big piece of, it was a huge piece of my healing process. It was a missing piece to my puzzle, actually, Sam. I, I still felt like I was, I had so much fragmentation. I felt like I didn't know myself. I, I felt like I was, the conditioned mind was still kind of running rampant, even with, you know, throughout the plant medicines and the fit for service and the breath works and all of that stuff in the shamanic work, I just, there was a missing piece as I was deconditioning myself and getting to know myself, human design helped me with that. And it also helped me learn a lot more of my trauma responses. So I include that and I have this intensive program that's coming out pretty soon and it's human design is involved in that. And it's not so much the foundational readings. I mean, I started doing the foundational readings because that's what people understand. Okay. My work has been using it to really help someone get to the bottom of their healing and, and using it as a healing modality and not just like, oh, I'm a manifester, I'm a projector, this is my strategy. It's like, it goes so much deeper. And so um, I incorporate that with everything else that I do. I, and the um, cold therapy, sorry. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you were uh, back in like February or what, January of 2021, you were on Clubhouse so much doing cold showers with people through Clubhouse. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, and a big part of my journey is doing 20 minute meditations in the ice bath and working through trauma and Wait, letting my what? body shake. Yep. 20 <laughs> minutes in the ice bath. Yeah. Please don't try that at home unless you're trained. It took me a long time to get to 20 minutes. Um, but that was another level because I still had traumatic experiences from the sex work. Honestly, I was right. still carrying people's energy and, um, it's all a gradual process. I mean, we'll shock the body if we try to heal overnight. Um, and I, and I, you know, any plant medicine that you do is not going to try to heal you overnight. It knows it's intelligent. Right. It's, you know, it's, the, it's the universe. It knows that you just need things in bite-sized pieces, but the cold therapy, um, also it helped, you know, it helped with my depression that I didn't know that I had. Um, but it also helped with energy clearing and healing and trauma, um, recovery. What, what I love about your work too, is that you approach it as if it is therapy because it is therapy, but oftentimes when we work with channelers or, you know, energy workers, things like that, we kind of generalizing, I get caught up in it being like the messages and this and that, knowing that I'm doing it for therapy. But when you put the intention behind it of realizing, hey, these are my quantum tools that I use to conduct therapy 
it just has a different experience. And I'm speaking from my experience in working with you and others. So I, I love it. You're rocking and rolling. It's so great. I appreciate you so much how you show up in the world on social media, on the internet, just uh, authentically and unapologetically you. And thank you for setting the example for other women to really own your story and not be afraid. So thank you so much, Vanessa. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. And the best place to get connected is probably Instagram. And from there, I'll link in the show notes of Vanessa's Instagram and her website, guys. So you can go straight to her website, sign up for her email list, check out her services. You can click on her Calendly to find a time that works for you to work with her or just follow her on Instagram and be, be prepared to laugh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Someone who keeps it real. All right, sweet, Vanessa. Thank you so much. We'll do this again. Thanks, Sam. Have a good one.